Okay, why don't we um, go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Gordon Richards with the LSST AGN uh, Science Collaboration. Uh, as with this morning, I'll, I'll chair the afternoon session. Uh, this is the fourth of six, uh, forming the meeting in a meeting on supermassive uh, black hole studies with uh, the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, um, put on by the AGN Science Collaboration. Uh, I'll remind everyone uh, that the AAS Code of Conduct and the LSSD AGN Science Collaborations Code of Conduct are, uh, apply, um, and that the meeting is, is being recorded so we can uh, make it available to others that can't join. Uh, everyone is, is muted, um, and you can uh, submit questions through the, the Q&A um, window at the bottom of your screen, and we'll go through those questions at the, at the end of each session. Uh, the talks are uh, 20 minutes uh, plus uh, 10 minutes for, for questions. Uh, in this afternoon session, we have three speakers, uh, Roberto Asif talking about uh, AGN uh, PhotoZ, uh, Paula Sanchez talking about uh, AGN uh, variability, uh, and uh, Rachel Webster talking about uh, changing look AGNs uh, from SkyMapper with prospects for LSST. Um, so without any further ado, I will turn it over to uh, Roberto and let him tell you about AGN PhotoZ and LSST. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, let me share my screen. All right, so yes, as, um, as mentioned, so I'll, I'll talk about uh, AGN photometric redshifts for uh, LSST. Um, in particular, in the context of the photometric redshift subgroup of the AGN Science Collaboration, which I'm currently the coordinator of. So just wanted to start by underscoring how important photometric redshifts are, are going to be for LSST. So overall, LSST may obtain observations of up to 100 million AGN or so, but of course, a very small number of those, about 10 million or so, might be, we might be able to identify from LSST data using all of the many different techniques that Gordon outlined in his talk uh, yesterday. And as uh, Neil pointed out, using multi-wavelength uh, observations, we may get up to uh, identifying 50 million AGN or so. These are staggeringly large numbers of AGN. And of course, for many of uh, the science applications that we would like to use this AGN for, um, we're gonna be limited by the spectroscopic follow-up. So there are some efforts, but of course it's going to be very difficult. Uh, uh, Franz Bauer is uh, looking into the possibility of using uh, foremost, for example, to obtain a significant number of uh, spectra of, of AGN and uh, detected by LSST. And eventually with Sphere X, we're also going to have a lot of uh, spectral lists of the brightest objects uh, in the sky. But still for the great majority of our science goals, we're gonna have to be relying on photometric redshifts. Now, uh, over the past two decades or so, photometric redshifts have really come a very long way. They have evolved enormously. There has been uh, many, many different SED modeling tools that have been developed in the literature uh, that uh, can model the SED and try to obtain the photometric redshift from that, as well as many other much more sophisticated techniques based on machine learning, like uh, neural networks, self-organizing maps, et cetera, uh, as well as using cross-correlation methods to use the redshift distribution of a different population of galaxies to tie the redshift of another, uh, a different population. Um, and in terms of, uh, so, I'm going to be overly simplistic here, but separating, uh, we can separate things into groups. So for galaxies, photometric redshifts are kind of getting very robust now. Robust enough that, you know, uh, large missions like Euclid are going to be very reliant on photometric redshifts. However, for type 1 AGN, we're really not there yet. So the photoses are notably less accurate. Uh, for type 2 AGNs, uh, they, were, they will tend to be fainter and harder to identify, and they're the ones where LSST is going to be less likely to identify that it is an AGN itself. But the great thing of type 2s is that because they're subdominated by the galaxy, then we'll actually be able to get pretty good photometric redshifts. But our main problem is uh, type 1 AGNs, which are going to be, again, the ones that will be majorly uh, identified by LSST. So um, this plot kind of uh, highlights uh, some of the issues I was mentioning. This is from work done by Gordon Richards a while back. Of course, this is not the state of the art, but it actually 
t uh, tells us, it shows pretty well the issues uh, I would like to highlight. So this is based on SDSS data, so optical data kind of like LSST wavelengths at least. And you can see that uh, comparing photometric redshift to the spectroscopic redshift, there's a significant width to the distribution. There's a lot of a scatter. But then very importantly, there is a lot of very strong outliers. So optics are really like very far away from the, the spectroscopic redshifts. Uh, perhaps here it's uh, a little bit clearer. This shows how broad the distribution in the difference of redshift can be and how far away these outliers can actually appear. Now, of course, as I mentioned, this is uh, just using SDSS data and from some time ago. This is uh, kind of probably closer to what the state of the art is now. This is from uh, work done by Brescia et al. in preparation for the EROSITA mission where they're using uh, machine learning uh, techniques, uh, combining not just SDSS, but also near infrared as well as mid infrared uh, to obtain photometric redshifts um, uh, for uh, fairly bright uh, sources that will be detected by Eurocid. And you can see that the scatter is getting significantly lower, but still is there, it still is quite significant. And there's still a, a lot of outliers. So uh, in this case, uh, we still have 13% outliers. And I would, um, uh, May you know though that this is not the same I was showing yesterday. This is now divided by one plus C, which is now a more standard way of uh, characterizing photometric redshift accuracies. For galaxies, I won't go into much deal about what this is, but we can do much better. So this is uh, work done by Masters et al. in preparation for Euclid, combining LSST-like data with Euclid-like data. You can see already that the distributions are getting significantly narrower, but very importantly, the, there's much lower number of uh, outliers. Uh, so this is just to highlight that for really when we think about photometric redshifts for galaxies, uh, we should be thinking very differently when for photometric redshifts of AGN. So we're always going to be dealing with a significantly broader error, error distribution, and that means that we really need to be uh, a lot more statistically, uh, statistically minded when we think about photometric redshifts into the science goals uh, that we want to achieve with AGN. Now, uh, very quickly, why is this low accuracy? Well, when using broadbands for type ones, uh, one of the main things is they simply just don't have any strong SED features, particularly for redshifts below three. A redshift above three, actually, you do get the Lyman break into the U-band and you can start seeing, uh, you can start having this, uh, this way of anchoring the redshift much better. But below redshift three, it's, it, there's simply just no strong features. Additionally, uh, optical variability can distort the SED and this is something that Paolo was mentioning in the morning session. And something that is very worth noticing is that this will affect more QSOs than Seifert. So Seifert galaxies, the galaxy luminosity is stronger. And so we have a higher galaxy contribution, we have more features, we can get a better SED, uh, get a better photo C. But uh, for QSOs, this, actual, this problem is actually a little bit amplified. The uh, accuracy is even a, a little bit worse than I was showing you before. Um, so uh, one thing else to mention that uh, Gordon did mention on his talk yesterday is that eventually, once we start applying uh, all of these techniques to real data, we're really going to want to do the selection and the photometric redshift determination simultaneously. We will want to think about this as one process. But for the moment, the science collaboration has decided to separate the two subgroups uh, because the requirements are going to be uh, relatively different on what we need for photo CSAT uh, just for selection. Now, uh, kind of very quickly, and again, oversimplifying things, if we want to think about how we estimate photometric redshifts, uh, I mentioned a little bit about it, but the two main families are going to be template fitting and machine learning. Um, very quickly, so with template fitting, when we're trying to model the SED using templates, uh, we can more easily tie what we're doing with physical properties. We can naturally get the probability distribution, and that makes it pretty easy to add physically motivated priors. Uh, particularly something that is interesting about template feeding is that when we have a very limited training set, uh, template feeding might be a little bit more robust when we are going out of that training set. Uh, of course, and the, uh, the negatives is, um, I'm sure most people here know, uh, are clear about this, but the accuracy can be significantly worse. And there's always, always, usually a much higher fraction of outliers. While with machine learning, we actually have 
the opposite. We have better accuracy, lower fraction of outliers, but there's always a much harder uh, time actually tying what we're finding, tying the constraints we're putting to more physical properties. Uh, getting the prob probability distribution is a little bit harder, although there's been a lot of work on that, and now it's starting to be more uh, routine to get the P of C using machine learning techniques. Uh, just to highlight, this is what I, the same I had shown before from this work by Breche et al. using machine learning. And this is the same, but using now the same sample of galaxies, but use a template feeding from Lefer. And you can see that the distribution gets a little bit wider, but also the outliers become much more uh, farther away from the distribution. And there's actually a higher fraction of outliers. And what I think something though that is very crucial is that if, from this work, uh, they showed this um, comparison of, uh, of outliers. So on the y-axis, it shows what you get from machine learning, uh, the difference between photo C and spec C, and on the x-axis, the same, but from template feeding. And what's very notable is that the outliers are not necessarily the same always for both populated, for, the, for both methods. So perhaps we should really be thinking of how we combine both things to really get kind of the best of both, wor of both worlds and try to limit the, our outliers and improve the redshift distribution. Now, LSST, of course, it's going to be a very unique survey in many ways. And with that, it will actually be able to uh, provide us with further information that we can add to our photometric redshift estimates. So one of the things that uh, people in the group have been working on, but so Gordon Richards is something Gordon mentioned on his talk yesterday, work that he has been doing with one of his students, B. Martin, um, it's uh, to estimate uh, how well could we use differential chromatic refraction to uh, constrain photometric redshifts. The idea is very simple. As you move on red, uh, through redshift, emission lines will pass through your, broad, uh, your broadbands, and that will cause an astrometric shift compared to what you would get with just a simple power law distribution that you would see for a star or for a galaxy. So that means that for those redshifts in which we get those very strong emission lines in the U-band or the G-band where, where you can aim to detect this, um, we're going to get a, a significant signal that can be used to constrain the redshift. And something that is very key is that this is completely independent of color. So it's really a completely new, a completely separate set of information that we're using for constraining the redshift. Now, as Gordon mentioned, it's actually not clear if in the way LSST is going to process data, if this is information that's going to be recoverable. And there's a lot of work going on to see how well it could be reported from the SDSS data reduction. Uh, I won't go into much detail ab about this, uh, but this is the simulations that uh, Gordon and his student have been doing on how well can you recover this TCR effect and how many observations and what spread over air mass you would need. And the answer is seems that you don't actually need that many observations and that much spread over error mass. It seems that after 10, 20 uh, observations, things are kind of getting more stable. But of course, the, this is a lot of work in progress. And there's a still a lot of things I know that Gordon needs to, wants to try and test to see how things work. Uh, additionally, uh, we'll also have variability from LSSD. And variability may actually be able to provide uh, constraints on the redshift, particularly may be able to break some of these strong degeneracies in redshift that create these very strong outliers. Uh, basically, uh, we expect that objects that are, or AGN that are, have higher Newton ratios or uh, higher luminosity to have longer variability time scales, right, in the down random well, for example, the tau parameter. So in um, in, this means that for a given measure observed variability time scale uh, for an AGN, you would be able, uh, if you want to put that AGN at higher redshift, that means that it needs a shorter variability time scale and a lower luminosity, which is actually the opposite that you get with magnitudes, where you need a higher luminosity to match a given observed magnitude. So actually being able to combine that, uh, those constraints with a, um, with a redshift may actually be able to improve the photometric redshift significantly. A word of caution, of course, is that, uh, so this is some work that Shimon Koslowski did, that uh, it's, you should be very wary of interpreting correlations between the DRW parameters and physical parameters. And that may be 
may say that this will not necessarily work or work as well as we might expect it to. But uh, even just from a purely observational point of view, this should be something that can be easily fed into neural networks, uh, for example. And so uh, maybe we should be uh, taking this and uh, uh, using uh, training samples like Quest or Stripe ET2, see how well we can really do uh, improving photoses. There's, uh, of course, multi-wavelength uh, follow-up, uh, which will likely be available for the DDFs that may be able to uh, very strongly increase uh, the accuracy of redshift, particularly once we have the Euclid data, uh, the near infrared is key to improving the AGN photoses. Uh, eventually, we may also have NeoCamp that at least will provide a mid infrared for the brighter galaxies that um, may also help a lot in identifying AGN and in providing the, the redshifts. Uh, and in terms of testing things, uh, this is something Neil mentioned already in his talk, but XMM LSS may be one of the best fields in which we would like to train these methods with multi-wavelength uh, data. There's a lot of multi-wavelength coverage and uh, there's a lot of, the, the optical is very deep from the DES imaging. This is just to show us from work from Brescia in 2013 uh, to show how much you can really improve redshifts with uh, multi wavelength data. And this is on the left is just SDSS, and on the right is combining SDSS with Galax, UKIDS, and WISE. You can really get rid of a lot of outliers, but also narrow the distributions significantly. There's also other information out there, so there's cross-correlation with galaxies. It's something I know that at least at, in the DESC, they're looking much uh, into doing it, and it might be applicable also to AGNs, although with some uh, caveats. And um, uh, we might also get morphology information, which gen typically as just an extra parameter, it's been shown to not really add too much to uh, the photometric relative accuracy. But uh, on one hand, it will at least allow us to separate extended from point sources, which uh, will, get, uh, will allow us to get better improved redshifts for the extended sources. Uh, but then also there may be a number of objects for which doing this uh, deep blending that like Federica was describing yesterday, we might be able to uh, measure or estimate a photometric redshift for the AGN itself and for the host galaxy separately and actually use that as a, a comparison within the same survey. And of course, we can always use luminosity priors, but they typically are, pre are quite weak. Uh, they may help with some relative degeneracies, but have been shown to actually not work that great for AGN. And all of this, what I'm going into, or what I, the, I guess the message that I think we should be uh, rescuing from this is that um, we're always going to be uh, dealing with very broad redshift distribution, very broad uh, error distributions for photo Cs. And we can use a lot of priors and add a lot of further information and constraints to machine learning techniques, but they, uh, particularly with priors, we may have, uh, end up also biasing our results because these distributions are so broad. So we really need to be thinking of not just what will be the most accurate photometric redshift I can get, but also what how uh, those estimates will statistically impact my science goals. And what do I really need statistically from the photometric redshifts to get the science uh, I would like. And so we, we may need to, uh, the idea is if we uh, can gather them, the more science cases uh, we can gather, the more we can tailor the techniques. And we may actually, uh, we may even need to provide more than one redshift estimate in the end for different science goals. Right. So a very, very simplistic scenario would be if you want to use uh, AGN variability or, to, or you want to determine an structure function, then you shouldn't really rely on photo Cs that were determined using variability uh, constraints, right? Because that will bias your results. So about two minutes for better. Okay, perfect. I'm about to end. Uh, so um, where do you come in? Well, as you see on why you should join the, the subgroup or, and the AGNSE. As you see, there's a lot of work to be done. There's still a lot of need. And that means that there's a lot of opportunities to get involved if you're interested in photometric redshifts. Uh, on one hand, uh, just uh, uh, contributing by, uh, with science cases will allow uh, for photosis to be more tailored to what actually uh, the SC would like to do. But then also there's a lot of a space for developing algorithms and for um, uh, uh, 
modifying algorithms to be to be applicable to the LSST, right? To be used when we have LSST data, as well as testing uh, different approaches and different codes. And this is also something that uh, this initiative that Gordon showed is getting uh, getting into comparing different uh, different codes and trying to see what we can do uh, what can do best. Uh, and so just. Uh, to end, uh, one of the things we were asked was to talk about uh, metrics, and I don't actually have a very uh, very detailed uh, metric to, to provide, but one of the things that I think we shouldn't forget is the, the importance of U-band. So for DCR, uh, this is something Gordon already mentioned, so I won't go into, into that. This, those are points two and three. But for uh, point one, um, deep enough uh, U-band will allow us to detect the Lyman break at redshift greater than three. So I would say as deep as we can go uh, compared to G would really improve photometric redshifts. And this is something uh, important because there's a lot of uh, strategies uh, for LSST observing that may actually end up with a much uh, fainter or with a much uh, shallower U-band compared to the rest. So with that, uh, I'm done. Uh, leave you with my contact information as well as with the uh, SC, the AGNSC uh, webpage, so you can start getting involved if you would like, to, and I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Roberto. Uh, we have time for some questions. If you have come in, I'll start going through them, but uh, certainly uh, other questions, uh, please go ahead and submit them. Uh, so Maurizio uh, Pelillo uh, basically, you know, says that the machine learning methods are only as good as the training sets, and you know, how do we make sure that they have, they cover the entire parameter space? Um, that is a great question too. I don't know if I have a good, uh, <laughs> a great answer. Um, so the, the closer we can get to what the LSST data will look like, uh, the, of course, the, the better. There are uh, at least at brighter magnitudes, there are things that are comparable, but I'm assuming that as the survey evolves throughout its 10 years, likely we'll continue improving on this and we'll continue using the DDFs as they get more and more data to actually be able to be reasonable training sets, at least for the fainter uh, populations. For the brighter populations, we'll need to think about extended follow-up just to cover more area um, in order to get them, uh, to get them well. Uh, so that would be my answer, but I, I think this is something that is going to be continuously evolving during the survey. Great. Uh, and so Michael Strauss says, uh, you say that the ability to measure photos is better uh, with CFRTs than for QSOs. Is that true, say, uh, for, say, equal contribution of galaxy and AGN light in a galaxy? That is, is there a confusion between the Galaxy and AGN features in the SED? And perhaps the answer is different if you have just optical data or uh, other wave bands like near IR, UV, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. So if you have near infrared data, you can actually recover the uh, sort of the minimum of the SED and towards the, the near infrared, then actually that provides an enormous amount of information for, for red chip determination. In terms of uh, half and half, uh, I think it will depend on things like obscuration as well. If you have a little bit of obscuration, it will depend significantly on redshift as well. Uh, but the more you can see the host galaxy uh, features, the better your SEDs or your, uh, your photoses are going to be. I don't think there's, I don't think I have much question about that. Uh, there is an issue of faintness though. So, uh, the worse that your photometry gets, the worse your photoses are going to be. So if you're looking into CFRTs pretty far away, that may actually outweigh all of the gains that you get from seeing the, the host galaxy. Great. Uh, and King Ling Ni asks, uh, to what redshift or surface brightness uh, do you think LSST morphology is useful in improving photosy? Well, um, as I mentioned, I, I don't think it will be that that greatly useful uh, in improving the the photo seas. But the extent, for the extended sources, those are the more seaford like uh, objects on which we actually get a lot of galaxy contribution. Otherwise, we would not see them as extended, right? So uh, separating those objects, which I imagine we'll be able to do to redshift of half, maybe. 
Um, I actually don't know exactly how well the deep learning techniques uh, will work, but a bridge of a half, I think, would be a good uh, a good rule of thumb. Okay, uh, and Sun Yoon asks if the poor accuracy of template matching is due to our incomplete understanding of AGN physics, can we apply multiple templates generated from different physics and test which template is better for individual objects uh, through hypothesis testing or model selection? And he's thinking, you know, more uh, in the case of uh, dealing with catastrophic outliers. Mm -hmm. So that would be definitely a, an, an interesting answer. So I would say that for a lot of those subjects, the issue is not really that the, that, that it's not really that you're using the wrong template necessarily. Is that there's so few features that you're dominated by the the photometric noise. So that would be the I, I think the the main thing now. Uh, if there's a really large, or we start discovering a significant population of AGNs that are off because we're using the wrong templates, uh, which may actually happen with LSSD, we're going to discover an enormous amount of things that we've never uh, thought, thought of. Those would be very interesting by themselves, so that uh, there may be real information in the outliers. It's not a perfect answer to the question, but I think that's the. Uh, but, mm -hmm. uh, and Dominic Beneford, uh, do you see a benefit for uh, Roman or, or, or W first uh, to play? Uh, 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 what role do you see for it to play in providing high angular resolution imaging, uh, deep near IR photometry, and deep slit spectroscopy, although potentially over a, a much smaller area? I mean, I think it would be fantastic because even that smaller area is going to be larger and deeper than uh, what we'll have done with any other survey. So already the inclusion of Euclid, I think it's going to have a, a very significant impact on improving the photoses. There's a lot of work showing that the near infrared is key because that's where you actually start seeing the not just inflections of the of the AG and CD, but also the inflections of the galaxy SED. Uh, the whole galaxy where it might be able to peak over the, the AGN emission, at least at low redshift. And um, uh, so I think it's really, uh, once the Roman Observatory really goes flying and we get a lot of data, it's going to be fantastic. We're going to get really good formatted redshifts and over an area larger than, you know, than we could do with anything else. Great. Um, Neil, did you have something that you were gonna ask uh, Directly here, or for sure. I just I, I'm always interested in the metrics because that's something that's going to be quite important in the near future for us. So, mm -hmm. um, when thinking of things from a metrics point of view, and I think you had so that that final slide, uh, do, do you advise any particular uh, balance of depths across UGRIZY? Clearly, you want deep U band, as you said. But aside from that, do you do you advise any particular depth balance among the bands for optimal photoses in general? Yeah, so the um, uh, I I would expect that the the more uniform the the depths are between U, G, R, I, and Z, the better that will actually do the uh, with with the photo C's. So the problem being that if you have one, uh, as long as just you have one data point that has a significant larger error bar than the rest. Then it adds, it starts adding a lot less information, and it uh, a lot it becomes a lot less constrained, in particular because we're not seeing things with a lot of features, right? So we are having we're seeing things that are pretty flat. Uh, so the uh, as long as you have the more uniform accuracy, I would expect that to be the best for photoses. Okay, great. But that is what we asked for in the AGN white paper for the deep drilling fields, at least. So you can hope that'll work out. Yeah. Perfect, yes. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, let me ask one more question while you stop screen sharing and let Paula get us set up. And I guess that's basically, what do you, what help do we think we need most from people in terms of, uh, you know, testing different uh, photo Z algorithms, um, you know, different codes and, and so on? Um, I think there's a, a lot of need in uh, adapting uh, algorithms. So there's a lot of very sophisticated processes already. So uh, 
So I think adapting them to the what the LSST reality will be, but that would be uh, that's one of the things where we need a lot of uh, a lot of work. But then also actually in contributing uh, science cases and starting to tailor your science cases and think of them in context of having a lot of uncertainty in the photo seas and uh, being able to to join uh, the photo seas with all of the science cases that. Uh, people would like to do. I think that's where a lot of the gain will be. Great. Thanks, Roberto. All right, so we're going to turn things over to uh, Paula sanchez uh, to talk about uh, AGN uh, variability. Paula. Hi. Good afternoon or good morning. <laughs> um, so today I would like to tell you about the ERC broker and particularly in the context of AGN variability studies. Uh, sorry. Okay. So first of all, what is ALERCE? So ALERCE is a Chilean initiative to build a community broker for the Vera Rubin LSST survey, but also for other large survey telescopes. So in particular, ALERCE now is working with the CTF alert stream, but everything is done to get ready for LSST in the future. So CTF is a smaller version of LSST, it's like LSST will provide at least 10 times more data than CTF, but it's very useful to use CTF to get ready uh, for the alert analysis and for all the machinery needed to process the LSST data. So the goals of alerts are basically to provide fast classification of transient variable stars and active galactic nuclei. In particular, we are doing this on real time. So whenever we receive an alert, we provide a classification. And also the idea is to be flexible enough to adapt to the different science cases and different taxonomies and to connect the LSST community with the follow-up facilities in order to um, make easier the, the follow-up of interesting sources. So from CTF, we have some similarities uh, between CTF and LSST, but uh, we only have photometry in the DNR band. Uh, while in LSST we will have mo more bands. And also the pixel scale is much broader in CTF compared to LSST. So using CTF is not very uh, a good idea to, for, for instance, uh, perform morphology analysis. So currently we're using PANSTARS data to, to also include some uh, morphology information in our models. So the alert pipeline receives the CTF stream and then analyze the data and provide two classifications. One is a stamp classifier and the Likert classifier. Today we focus mostly on the Likert classifier, but I will also briefly mention the stamp classifier. And if you want to have access to these classifications, you can connect to the alert stream. So the stamp classifier uh, is a model that classifies the sources when uh, a, a new detection is observed for a given object. So whenever a source is observed for the first time, we classify the source using this classifier that use a convolutional neural network implemented in the science image, the templates, and the difference image. So this is very useful to classify early targets. And we are using now uh, this model to classify AGNs, supernovae, variable stars, asteroids, and bubbles. But all these machinery is constructed in a way that is optimized to classify supernovae. So the idea of this model is to detect junk supernovae in very early stages and uh, perform a rapid follow-up of them. So for the case of active galaxies, the Likert classifier is more important. And this is a work uh, that I just submit to the Astrophysical Journal um, like a couple of weeks ago. And the idea of this model is to use a balanced hierarchical random forest to classify all the objects with six or more alerts in a given band. So in this case, we use the whole Likert, not just the first uh, stamp. And we are able to classify the sources in a more broader taxonomy. So in this case, in this case we have 15 classes separating between transients, stochastic sources, and periodic sources. And in particular, we have three classes of active galaxies. So this model is called balanced because it uses a Python package called the uh, imbalance learn that is very useful to train models that used a very um, imbalanced training sets. And uh, it's called hierarchical because it's used for uh, random forest classifiers that first goes through a hierarchical classification that separates all the sources as transients, stochastic, and periodic. 
And then every source is classified by the transient classifier that separates uh, the subclasses of supernovae, the stochastic classifier that separates the different classes of uh, active galaxies, cataclysmic the variable and young star objects, and a periodic classifier that separates the, the periodic sources. So in order to get the, the final classification, what we do is we multiply the, the probability of being uh, a given, to have a given class in the first level, and then we multiply by its correspondent class in the sub-level uh, classifiers. So for instance, if you want to uh, know the, the probability of being a blazer, you have to multiply the probability of being a stochastic source and the probability of being a blazer in the stochastic classifier. And then the final class is determined by finding the maximum probability. So to train this model, we have to use a label set and we compile different catalogs and cross match them with the CTF data in order to uh, have the, our final training set. And in particular for active galaxies, we are using the Milliquas catalog and also some SDSS catalogs and the Roma Visita Cat catalog for placers. So for the case of uh, quasars, we are selecting all the sources that are classified as Q in Milliquas, that means core dominated sources. And in the case of AGNs, we are considering all the host dominated sources, the A class in Milliquas. So in Milliquas separates the sources using a luminosity cut, as you can see here. So basically, uh, sources with lower luminosities are called host dominated and, and bright sources are, are called core dominated. And you can see here that also the, the, the quasars dominate completely the stochastic class with 63% of the sources, while blazars are one of the minority classes. So it's very important to use uh, this uh, imbalance packet because it helps you to, to deal with these high imbalances in your training set. So in order to classify, we need features. And we have two kinds of features. The first one are you are compute using the detections. So a detection is everything that you measure in the difference image that produce a five sigma difference between the science and the template images. And the non-detections are uh, upper limits that are provided by uh, CTF whenever a source uh, is not present in, a, in the difference image or uh, doesn't pass the five sigma threshold. So you can use this information uh, to compute different features. In particular, we have 150 features for both bands, G and R, which are the public bands for CTF. And we also use uh, all wise data to compute some colors. And in particular for the detection features, we are using the classical features that uh, previous words are used for uh, AGN analysis, like the structure function and time random walk modeling. But we are also using non-detection features that are very useful to say when a source is, for instance, appearing or disappearing, when a source is not showing much variability, etc. And we, are, we also have a CTF metadata and it's very useful to, for instance, know the quality of the alert, the morphology of the alert from pan stars and the coordinates. And all these features are designed in a way that can be used in LSST data. So we are designing new features and we are implementing uh, features that are already in the literature to uh, get ready uh, for LSST. So I want to mention uh, two particular models that are very useful for the selection of active galaxies and have never been used before in the literature for classification. So the first one is this irregular autoregressive model that is similar to a damp random walk model, but in discrete, is, a, is in a discrete space and it's also irregular. And in particular, this phi parameter is the level of autocorrelation that you can measure in the library. And it's very useful to separate, for instance, sources with short periods from transients and stochastic sources. So for the case of type 1a supernovae, air lyras and quasars, you have this distribution for this feature. So quasars have values close to one, that means they have a very high uh, autocorrelation. Erlarias in the unfolded light curves uh, have very low correlation, so they are close to zero, and transients have more uh, intermediate behaviors. Other uh, useful model analysis is to implement the Mexican hat power spectrum proposed by Patricia Revalo in 2012, where you can filter the light curves using a Mexican hat and separate the different structures observe at different time scales. 
So we are using this model to measure the variance of the Likers at two different time scales. And in particular, we are measuring the variance at 10 days and 100 days. And we select these days because they are very useful to separate, for instance, long period variables from uh, active galaxies. In previous work, we have found that long period variables can be one of the main contaminants in the selection of AGNs. So it's very important to have features that are uh, good to separate them. And in this case, for instance, when you see the variability at short time scales, you can see that long period variables doesn't show much variability, but at long time scales, they can have variability, uh, very large uh, variability amplitudes. So using these features, we, we can separate these populations. And also, they are also uh, very useful to separate stochastic, transient, and periodic sources. So using this classifier, we are obtaining very good results. Here you can see the confusion matrices obtained for the first level of the classifier, the, the hierarchical level, and the uh, multi-class level with the 15 classes. And in particular, you can see here that we are able to separate quasars, AGN, and blazers in a very good way. So using this classifier, we uh, classify all the sources in the CTF alert stream with more than six alerts in a given band. So uh, we have a considerable no a number of quasars, AGN, and blazer candidates. And if you see the distribution of these candidates in the sky, you will see that most of them are located outside the galactic plane and have colors that are uh, similar to the, the typical colors that you expect for these kind of populations. And when these objects are detected in the galactic plane, they tend to show lower probabilities in the classifier and also redder colors. So when you compare the both classifiers available in Alerse, you can see that there is a very good synergy between them. So in the y-axis, you have the results obtained for the stamp classifier and in the x-axis for, for the Likert classifier. And you can see that sources that are classified as supernovas in the stamp classifier are also classified as uh, supernovas in the Likert classifier. And the same happened for AGN's classes and the variable stars. So now I want to focus mostly on the uh, results for active galaxies. So we had around 30,000 active galaxy candidates. Most of them are quasars, uh, but we also have a lot of AGNs and blazers. And they, a high fraction of them is also confirmed from the literature. And here in the, in the left panels, you can see typical Likers that we observe for uh, AGNs and quasar candidates. And in the right panel, you can see the colors for sources with SDSS, SDSS data. And in general, core-dominated sources or quasar tend to have much bluer colors compared to AGNs. And we are also finding very interesting candidates, uh, which are, for instance, uh, classified as galaxy by other surveys like SDSS or in the SIMBAT uh, database. And we are thinking that maybe these sources can be low luminosity AGNs, because if you see the colors in the reference images, they tend to be very red. But if you see the different light curves, they tend to show bluer colors. So, we submitted a proposal uh, for VLT, and we are expecting to, to get the times. So once we confirm these sources as low luminosity AGNs, we, we can construct a training set for low luminosity AGNs and include them as a new class in the um, taxonomy. So what do we know from previous results? Well, here you have a comparison of the X-ray flux versus ear band magnitude for uh, sources from the cosmos field. Um, and in blue, you have sources that are classified as low luminosity AGNs according to their X-ray luminosity. And in, in lines, you have the flux limit for erosita in, in black. In red, you have CTF and in blue, LSST. And it can be seen that most of these sources uh, should be detected using uh, LSST data, but not erosita. And with CTF, we, we should be able to detect a considerable fraction of them. So uh, the idea of this project is to create all the machinery needed to find these kind of sources and get ready once the LSST starts its operation so we, we can uh, detect all the fainter uh, sources. And we also have uh, some interesting candidates uh, regarding, for instance, uh, narrow line sources that show variability in the optical range. So 
we also submit a proposal to observe them because we have uh, around 50 candidates uh, that are classified as narrowline agents and five that are classified as narrowline quasars in Miliquas, and they show a high fraction of the variability. So we submit a proposal to observe all the candidates that are visible uh, from the southern hemisphere uh, and ob uh, to observe them with SOAR. But one of the problems that we found uh, during the analysis of these candidates is that uh, the number of candidates is very low compared to what we should expect. So for instance, in the CTF, um, in the same area covered by CTF, in Miliquas there are 1.8 million objects. So we go to uh, Miliquas and compare all the sources that are classified as candidates by the CTF alert stream. And we only, uh, in, the, in the best cases, we can only reach 20% of the, of the Miliqua sources in CTF. So this is uh, very uh, interesting because for LSST, e every night we will have access to the alerts, not the, not the whole Likers. So uh, we need to know where are these sources in order to see if we, we should go to the alerts or to the data releases in order to find them. So if, for instance, if we go to the CTF data release, there are 1.5 million sources with Likers that are, are also in the Liquas. So compare 1.5 million with 30,000 sources. It's a huge difference. So uh, probably this, are, this is telling us that instead of using the alert stream for uh, statistically significant studies of AGM variability, we will need to go to the data releases. So now I want to show you the, the, the tools that you can use uh, to, ha to have access to the Alerse data products. So if you go to alerse.online, you will see this website where you can select a classifier, for instance, the Likert classifier, and your desired class. And then you will see the list of all the candidates. And if you click in one, you will see the Likert, you will see the coordinates, links to different databases, the Aladdin image. You can also download the Likert, see the stamps, uh, some statistics. So this uh, tool is very useful to explore the Likert. And if you want to uh, download the data, well, you can use this system, but also you can go to Alert Set of Science and see all the Jupyter notebooks that we have explaining how to access the database. So the feature work regarding uh, the ADM variability studies in alert set, since now we have the classifier, now we can use the classifier to, to do actual science. Uh, so one of the ideas is to study changing state agents. In particular, we want to do uh, apply forecasting methods and also to create watch lists where we will be monitoring every night the behavior of some interesting sources. Uh, we are also trying to estimate whether CTF and LSST will provide a, a good cadence to select intermediate maps platforms. And also uh, in the future, once we have enough data, we want to uh, perform ADN variability analysis and relate the ADN variability features with black hole physical properties. So in the past, we have tried to do this using, for instance, some random work modeling or kernel analysis, but we need to uh, create longer light curves in order to obtain better results. So all these uh, projects are being doing with CTF, but the idea is to get ready for LSST once it starts operations. And in particular, I want to take a couple of minutes to discuss some metrics regarding uh, this uh, uh, modeling of light curves, because, well, um, Roberto minutes. already, okay. Roberto already say something about this. So um, one, when, when you try to model uh, Likers of agents with damp random walk and, and you want to use the features to study the physics of the sources, you need to have long Likers. For instance, uh, in, in a study that we performed in 2017 uh, and also Kozlowski in the same year, uh, we found that when you have short Likers, with uh, lengths 10 times smaller than uh, the tau that you want to measure, you, you can retrieve the actual value of the tau that, that you, you need. So here we simulate light curves with a given 
tau uh, time scale and a given length. And we found that once, when, whenever the light curves are too short, you are not able to find the proper tau values. So uh, with this, we demonstrate that we need at least 10 times the time scale of the variability to be able to measure it properly. So uh, typical AGNs have time scales of one year. So we will need the 10 years of the survey in order to, to use these features to study the physics. For uh, classifications, they can be fine, but if, if we want to connect these features with the physical properties of the sources, we need better light curves. So uh, this is a summary, and here you can see the links. So please go to alertsa.science. We have a lot of tools. Uh, we have put a lot of effort in providing very nice uh, APIs for the community. So I invite you to go to this website and also the Twitter account. And also I give you my email if, if you need to contact me. Thanks. Great, thanks Paula. Um, so we have time for some questions. A number have come in already and I'll get started with those while people think of more. Um, Matthew Graham had comment, had, had basically asked if you're using the alert light curves rather than the data release ones, which I think you answered, but then he followed up with um, the comment that ZTF produces alerts for five sigma detections relative to reference magnitudes, uh, which translates to a magnitude difference of about 0.3 at 18th magnitude. Uh, so AGN variability would be below this for fainter sources. Yes. Yeah, so actually that's what we are seeing now that for faint sources beyond 18 magnitudes, it's very hard to detect something uh, for, for AGNs. Uh, so yeah, uh, and actually now we are working on um, a complementary paper where we analyze the candidates and we will discuss that issue. Great. Um, Il Sang Yun says, uh, he's curious about what fraction of sources in your study belong to none of the classes in your classifier, uh, thinking of how much this would be useful to discover rare populations that, age, that LSST might find. Okay, so the, the model that, that we are using now is not very useful to find outliers. So all the sources are assigned to one of the 15 classes in the classifier. Uh, for the periodic sources, we have the periodic other class. So sources that are periodic and are not included in one of the classes goes to that class. But for stochastic and transients, we don't have that uh, other class. So everything is assigned to a given class, but we are also developing some outliers classifier. I, I, I don't have anything to show now because it's something that we are still developing, but uh, we, we are aware of that and we are working on uh, outlier selection algorithm. Uh, Michael Strauss uh, says your sample consists of objects with six or more photometric points. Uh, can you say more about why six observations is the threshold you use? How does the reliability of the classification depend on the number of observations? Yeah, but that's actually a good question. Uh, we define six feature, uh, six uh, alerts per, per object because uh, we, we did some tests in the past and we found that with six uh, alerts, at least you can do a very basic analysis of the light curve. So if you want to find, for instance, periods, you need uh, m like more than 20 uh, detections. But for very basic statistics like the standard deviation or uh, average, with six, we are more or less fine. So that's something that we test in the past. Uh, but we know that uh, it's not the best case for most of the uh, features that we normally use for AGNs. But uh, for those cases, when, when we have a low number of observations, we have the colors. So uh, even though you, you can have sources with less, than, uh, with less than 10 epochs, you will still be able to, to have a classification with a very high accuracy uh, because we also have the colors from white and CTF. So now we are analyzing all the results and, and you will see soon in, in a future work, uh, all the analysis regarding the, how well is the selection, uh, comparing the number of detections, the number of, uh, the length of the light curves. Uh, so yes, you, you have to wait for the, the analysis, sorry. Great, thanks. Uh, 
uh, Sebhanik uh, asks, uh, are you classifying based on light curves from difference imaging or for cytometry on the normal images? Uh, any justification of choice in your opinion on what we should do for LSST? Okay, so we are using the LERT. So is uh, the, the photometry that we have is the, for the difference images. We are not using force photometry. Um, so because it's not still provided by, by CTA. Well, Matthew gives some comments about that in, in the chat. Uh, so uh, what we are doing is we obtain the, the flux or the magnitudes from the difference images and we convert those using the reference the, the, the photometry from the reference image to obtain the, the final light curve. And from and to those light curves, we uh, apply the classifier. So that's why we have a lot of missing sources because we are just using the alerts. So no for photometry at all. Okay, great. So oh, I just uh, I accidentally hid Matthew's comment. Um, so Matthew followed up uh, just to say that ZTF is aiming to move the force photometry uh, and alerts, move to force photometry and alerts in phase two rather than non-detections. So I think that's a good thing, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Actually for AGNs, that's much better than what we currently have because as you, you see uh, the number of missing agents is very high in the alerts. So we need to go to force photometry or to the data releases in order to, to find all of them. Okay. Uh, it's time for a, a couple more questions if anybody has them. Uh, let me ask while uh, I'm waiting to see if anybody does. Um, you know, I talked about yesterday uh, looking to build a, sort of two specific training sets. I mean, obviously, you know, we wanna, we can, develop training sets over whatever area we want, but uh, any idea uh, how many objects would be sort of in the Stripe 82 and XMM LSS area that you've been looking at? So sorry, I didn't get the last part. The, the Stripe 82 and XMM LSS area where we're trying to build, uh, you know, more general training sets. Uh, do you know how many objects that you've been looking at would might be in those regions? Ooh. I I don't know because since we're using the alerts, for instance, in the cosmos field, we found just in the whole field, less than 50 sources when we do the cross match with the CTF alerts. So I guess we will find similar numbers for XMM if we use the alerts. But um, I don't know what you will find if you look at the, the data release. So yeah, it's, it's hard to say from the alert size. Okay, great. Um, so similar number or similar number per area. Yeah. XMM LSS is about two or three times bigger than Cosmos. Yeah, well, yeah, the, the, the normal Cosmos, the, the one that we studied in Quest is, it has the same, the same area because okay. it was the, the, whole, the whole field of the camera. Uh, and then Paolo Copi uh, asks, uh, what's the shortest ZTF time scale in Quest? Uh, less than one day time scales. Uh, I'll, well, I'll let you read that and interpret it. <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, it depends on the area of the Maybe, sky. Can you paraphrase Maybe. what he's asking? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, actually that the, the, this irregular um, autoperolation model is very dependent on the, um, the cadence. So for the typical cadence of, for, of CTF, it's uh, very useful. But if you go to shorter uh, cadences, um, you will need uh, to modify the, the algorithm. But typically CTF is observed sources every three nights, in some cases, uh, twice per night, it depends on the, of the field in the sky. But it's, uh, in general, it's very similar to what you will have with LSST. Uh, so uh, we, we can say that in average, is you, you have an observation every three nights. Uh, so to discriminate between error and, and quasars, you can use 
this autocorrelation parameter, but also there are several other features that are very useful. Actually, we also discovered that even damp random walk modeling in uh, variable stars like curves is a very good feature to, to select them. Well, sometimes you don't have access to a very good Likert, so you cannot measure the period. But if you implement that random work modeling, at least you can have an idea of the time scale. So uh, even though we have observations every three nights, sometimes more, uh, using a combination of features, we are able to, to measure more or less the time scale of the variability of every class. So yeah, I don't know that having uh, time scales, uh, sorry, uh, cadences of uh, three nights or more is an issue here because we have 150 features. So at least one of them will be able to measure properly the, the variability. Great, thanks Paula. Um, I think we should switch over to Rachel at this point. Um, while that's happening, I'll just add, uh, Matthew Graham followed up with it. ZTF has some deep drilling uh, data which has 40 second resolution and that phase two would also see a move to two night cadence. So thanks for that. Um, okay, so Rachel Webster is going to finish out the afternoon session talking about uh, changing look AGNs. Uh, Rachel, go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Gordon. And I wanted to thank Gordon and Neil for organizing uh, this meeting in a meeting. Uh, this session has two from Chile and one from Australia. Uh, and uh, so this is a wonderful opportunity for us to participate as well. Um, I wanted to um, just note that in this um, session, I'm presenting on behalf of people from both the University of Melbourne and ANU. Um, we're working together using SkyMapper data and other uh, Australian facilities and anything else we can lay our hands on uh, to see what we can do to prepare for the LSST era. So let me start by saying, making a few comments about context. And really we've been quite strongly motivated by thinking about the science ultimately that we want to do. And there are really two key areas, I think, one is formation and evolution of high redshift black holes. And shall we uh, talk about this this morning um, in some detail? A fascinating area um, and obviously highly important for large scale formation of large scale structure. The second is coevolution of black holes and galaxies. And in that context, you know, understanding outflows and the impact of uh, jets um, and, you know, BLRs on their environments is important. And if we're going to link um, the sort of observations we can make um, through to understanding the physics, then we need, um, we need a, a good model, uh, you know, a, a good working model uh, to act as a diagnostic. And I'm going to, um, you know, the um, model I'm showing here is the old Murray et al model from uh, the mid 90s um, and I'm going to make some comments in a, in a few moments about the model that we've been working within. I'm then going to go on and talk a little bit about our searches for changing look AGN and make um, some comments after that about TDEs uh, um, and in particular um, since Katie or Kettle is joining us in Melbourne um, I think that will become one of our foci as well. At the end I'm, I'll just make a couple of have a couple of quick slides on high redshift quasars overlapping epi low bowels um, and um, just note as well that we're very keen to find all the quads, all the bright quads in the southern hemisphere for very obvious reasons. Okay, so, so the model um, that we've been working in is a little different from those early models um, where uh, the disk wind uh, was modeled um, as a, as, with a fairly narrow opening angle. So, um, this is work uh, done with um, one of my PhD students, um, uh, Suki Yong, um, and um, you can see the diagram here. And w w looking at BALs, we've um, we, we think there's very strong argument, as um, other people have also observed, uh, that the wind is actually a wide-angle wind and actually fills, you know, most of the available opening angle. Um, the, the beauty of the model that we've been working with is that it's pretty simple. Um, it has colloidal and rotational components in the, in the outflow. 
Um, obviously, there are quite a few variables, but as we're um, investigating um, more deeply into the, into the data, we're starting to be able to constrain some of those variables. Uh, two, two important points here. Uh, one is that we think, uh, well, we're able to actually model velocity offsets of the high ionization lines from low ionization lines. And we're also able to model the uh, full width half maximum of the lines. And if you look over on the right of the screen, you'll see that we're seeing a correlation between the, um, the offset between high ionization line carbon four and magnesium to a low ionization line that's correlated with the ratio of the equivalent widths of those lines, which tells us that they're not arising in the same part of the wind. They've obviously got um, different physical um, or reflecting the different physical characteristics of the part of the wind that they're being formed in. Now, what this means is that the F in the determination of the black hole mass um, is, uh, will we'll first of all depend on orientation um, and secondly uh, depends on the um, particular emission line uh, that you're using. And clearly since that's um, our ma major mechanism for determining black hole mass, particularly at high redshift, um, understanding uh, you know, these models and, and evolving them a bit is, is, is very important. So Let's move on to uh, changing look AGN. Oh, and, and I should say, um, so SkyMapper, as I'm going to explain a little bit further later on, is uh, you know, largely, I mean, it's a 1.3 meter telescope. And so it, it's, the photometry is not particularly deep. Um, it'll go to uh, 19th, 20th um, in the final catalog. Um, and so, so we've been concentrating on thinking about, or, or trying to understand what's going on um, at in at lower redshift rather than at high redshift. And to that end, thinking about um, having complete samples of objects so that we can um, use the, the, the power of LSST uh, for um, time domain mapping um, to, to really understand what's going on in as complete a sample as possible. So, so we've been playing around looking at how to find changing look AGN. And um, obviously, um, in looking at the criteria that other researchers have applied. Um, and uh, the, first, the first comment I want to make is that the, so, so far, the definition has been largely based on search criteria. But, um, and but most of the searches have been in type one samples and they've looked for a significant continuum change in the G band and then looked for changes in H beta and H alpha emission lines. I want to uh, just simplify uh, that a little bit and say that a changing look AGN is an AGN that changes its type, you know, from type 1 to 1.5 or to 2. Um, and taking, taking that definition, or, or at least taking the observations there have been early on, there were quite a number of um, models uh, for, for the physical um, understanding of what was going on, um, most of which have been ruled out. But uh, the, the most promising one, I think, is what I would call um, a faltering illumination of a disk wind uh, model. And uh, there's a, a, a very, uh, I've shown here a plot from Chelsea McLeod uh, recently, um, looking at uh, the changing look quasars and AGN that she, she has found and plotting a parameter uh, from uh, a, a Litzo and, and Ho primarily, um, which, which uh, um, gives a physical measure of when we um, expect a, a broad line region uh, to, to form. And what we see is that the changing look AGN sit on the, um, on the low side of that parameter. In other words, um, and, and which is quite closely related to the, uh, to the Eddington uh, ratio. And, and, and what this is telling us is that um, the changing look AGN, you know, are, are in a regime where um, the, the disk wind is perhaps just forming um, where the illumination is, 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 is probably sporadic. So if that's the case, then um, what we want to be able to do is not only find type ones going to type twos, but to be able to look at type twos uh, going to type one. We want to understand not only what's happening to the H alpha and H beta emission lines, but other emission lines as well. And also to understand whether the, the uh, continuum emission uh, that is currently used to 
or, or routinely used to select these is necessary or whether, whether there's some other uh, criteria that we can select on. So, um, we, as I said, we've been playing around with uh, lots of uh, searches in different data sets. Um, and but I'm only going to speak about one today, which is um, a, a, a study to look at or to take uh, manga uh, spectra of AGN and, uh, and those uh, IFU spectra, and then to compare those to um, SDSS spectra of the same objects. Uh, so we selected AGN uh, using the SDS um, classifications, which we subsequently discovered are not all correct. It is an automatic, automated classifier, so there are, uh, there, there are not only AGN in the sample. And then we did an automated search of the, um, of the ratioed spectra. Um, and what we found out of that sample, four that we would classify as changing look AGN, and, and four other interesting objects. Um, and I should say, um, uh, well, and you see on the right here, we've got a BBPT diagram, um, which um, uh, the, the work, the four that we found are the blue dots on here. There are a number of changing look AGN from other, other uh, authors. Um, and then the red ones are these supplementary interesting, or some of the three of the supplementary interesting objects that we found. Uh, what this study showed us, there are there were, there were three, um, important uh, things that we learned from this. One is that, well, we picked up about 1% of the AGN, which changed in both directions. So we've got, um, you know, twos going to ones and ones going to twos, roughly. I mean, uh, obviously within the uh, different um, types of, of AGN. So they're not complete changes from one to twos. Um, interestingly, none of these with the data that we had available, um, and that was fairly incomplete, but none of them showed large G-band changes. In other words, we wouldn't have selected them uh, from uh, their uh, photometry. Uh, this is not terribly surprising um, at one level because um, all of these have uh, significant amounts of uh, galaxy light. And so, you know, the amount of galaxy light and the aperture matter um, when it comes to looking at um, or, or selecting these sort of objects. Um, so I've got, I've got Two spectra here, uh, just to illustrate the sort of things that are going on. So the top one is one of the um, changing look um, AGN, and this one um, has gone from a 1.5 to a 1.9, and it illustrates um, the technique that we used to um, initial do our initial cut uh, to look uh, for changing look AGN, which was uh, ratioing them. And you can see, um, in fact, in this case, we had three spectra. Um, Manga, SDSS, and BOSS, um, and the uh, the BOSS and SDSS are essentially the same, um, and the Manga um, has uh, shown a significant variation. Um, the second uh, spectrum uh, that I've got down the bottom here is one of the four um, interesting uh, spectra that we found. Um, this one is, is somewhat more difficult to uh, classify, but you'll see uh, that there's been a significant change in the H um, alpha line, which is not uh, reflected uh, or, or not obviously reflected in the H beta line. We've got the lines on where H beta, the, the H beta um, changes would occur um, are marked. Um, and um, this is one of those ones that we, uh, we, we, we don't really understand, I think would be uh, the best uh, way of putting this. And, the, and I guess this speaks to um, one of the comments that somebody made earlier in the day about, you know, how are we going to pick up interesting objects? And, and this is certainly one way of, of doing that. Okay, so I want to move on now to talk about um, SkyMapper and uh, the potential of SkyMapper to help with these sort of studies. Um, DR1, the data release one and two are both uh, are freely available now. Data release three is um, uh, significantly improved on data release two, um, available from February this year. At the moment, uh, just available uh, to the Australian collaborators, but it will be released um, more broadly in about 18 months time. This uh, data release is still not complete. There are some limitations 
in the U and V bands, uh, but we think we understand those. And it's cross-referenced with all the, uh, all the things that you might expect. Um, so one of the, um, so the, the sky mapper has some uh, advantages um, and I think will provide a strong um, and useful zero point for LSST. So the, it, it is bright photometry, uh, 17 to 18 for the bright survey, 19 to 20 for the deeper survey, but the photometry is now very, very good. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of the bugs have been ironed out and it does cover the whole southern sky. So this is a tremendous advantage in terms of thinking about setting a zero point uh, for the LSST photometry. I've put the, um, I'm showing the uh, filters, the filter set for SkyMapper um, on this slide here. And, and what you'll see is that there are two filters in the, uh, where LSST and SDSS have a single filter in the U-band. <coughs> this was because uh, people at ANU wanted to find uh, low metal, low, very low metallicity stars and, and these straddled the 4000 um, break. But they, also produce something very interesting, which is a capacity to separate uh, quasars and galaxies at low redshift. And in the bottom panel, you'll see um, a simulation. So this is uh, from Chris Wolf, um, a paper that he hasn't yet submitted, um, but um, color color plots using uh, the uh, the U minus V differences, and these are synthetic spectra spectra of AGN in the green and uh, uh, galaxies in the black with star formation, uh, various uh, models for bursting and uh, so on star formation uh, shown in the black. And what you can see is that those those two filters, the U and the V filter, separate these very nicely um, when you move into the redder bands, uh, quasars and um, galaxies are, uh, well, um, not easy to separate. So taking this idea, what Chris has done is to, um, is to then plot out um, uh, some grids uh, from, from those simulations. And you can see in this diagram here, these are shown uh, with these uh, blue grid lines. Uh, the green dots are, are galaxies. And then over the top, he's sort of gone in and classified some AGN uh, to sort of show where they end up. So you can see down in the bottom um, uh, right-hand corner, 1.9s to 2s, 1.8s, 1 to 1.5s in the various colours and where they fall in the diagram. But what you can see is that certainly out to a redshift um, of about 0.6 or 0.8, sorry, 0 0.06 or 0 0.08, we can nicely separate out um, uh, these, these, um, these galaxies uh, from well, well, the active galaxies um, from uh, from the general population. So, um, so this um, this, along with um, uh, some of the spectroscopic data, is providing us with um, the opportunity to um, come up with a complete, or what we believe will be a complete, southern safer spectroscopic sample. And by complete, what we're hoping we'll be able to do is um, generate a sample that has both safer ones and safer twos in it. Um, so also um, inputting into this, so we, we've got the photometry from SkyMapper um, and we can, we, can use, um, we can use that to, to provide us with a first cut. We've gone back and looked at the 60th um, galaxy survey, which was done 20 odd years ago. Um, and uh, those spectra have never been morphologically classified. Um, so they're, in some senses, they're pretty crappy, but, um, but they are a pre pretty complete uh, sample to um, an R magnitude of about 15.6. Um, and already we've pulled out a sample of about 7,000 AGN, and we're in the process of classifying those uh, through the full um, full um, range of AGN types. Um, in addition to those spectra, though, um, the Taipan survey, which has been very late uh, getting started on the UK Schmidt, but this is, so this is an upgraded um, spectroscopic survey, which will um, uh, go to an eye of um, about 17, is just about to start. And so we'll, um, we'll obviously 
um, revisit all the um, AGN that we select in this way, but and also any new ones uh, that come from the uh, photometric um, uh, classifier that Chris, Chris has developed. So uh, we certainly hope um, that this sample will be complete by the time LSST goes live. And what that will enable us to do is to have a complete and targeted sample that we can then, um, we can then monitor uh, for photometric changes. All right, um, so- Two minutes, Rachel. Okay, um, I better be quick then. Um, so uh, just a couple of comments about uh, TDEs. Um, are they really two sides of the same coin? Um, and uh, so Katie has given me a couple of slides just showing um, some of the state of the art on TDEs at the moment. And uh, this, this is um, basically the TDE community is seeing that the, um, the orientation that we observe the TDE from determines exactly what we see in terms of um, X-ray and op optical UV. So, so there's an orientation dependence there. Um, the TDEs typically probe um, black holes with masses from 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 8 solar masses. After that, um, stars get swallowed whole. Um, and so, so they're probing a similar mass range to the sort of safe example that we're starting to put together. And then um, finally, yes, there are differences uh, between the TDEs and the AGN, but it's not a completely clean uh, separation. Um, there are a couple of papers uh, where, um, with long discussions about whether it's a TDE or an AGN and, and whether or not the accretion processes that are feeding uh, these black holes are, are sort of, uh, you know, fairly smooth and continuous or, or quite sporadic. Um, so, as I say, there may be two sides of the same coin. Just my last couple of slides. Uh, oh, uh, well, and um, just to finish up on TDEs, um, they're predicting about a thousand will be observed per year um, with LSST. Um, so this is um, a very um, exciting and complementary uh, study, I think, to the Changing Look AGN. Um, so two quick slides on other projects. Uh, a recently uh, um, submitted paper from Chris Onken and Chris Wolf um, with uh, their high Z, latest high Z quasar. Um, this is obviously very bright, very massive, Eddington ratio of 0.4. So um, these won't, with SkyMapper, we won't go to high redshift, but we will get these um, very massive um, AGN. And of course, uh, because these are selected by dropouts, we're also finding a lot of FE low bowels or overlapping FE low bowels. Here's one here. Um, we've got at least a dozen already, um, but they're coming in thick and fast. And I think um, provide um, really interesting science to further understand um, AGN. So just to finish up um, my summary, uh, I think um, it's really important to have a, a realistic disk wind model to drive the physical insight um, and, and to allow us to start to um, really understand um, what, what, the, what, what the real parameters are uh, that describe this sort of AGNs uh, that we're observing. SkyMapper, I think, um, will provide an excellent zero point for LSST um, in the local universe. Um, for the sort of science that I'm interested in, spectroscopy is quite crucial for the physical interpretation. Uh, we um, hope to have our complete sample of Southern Seyfert's um, in time for LSST turning on. Um, and um, and of course, LSST, I, I think is, I mean, the time domain for AGN, I think just has enormous potential for, for understanding uh, the physics of what's going on. So thank you. Great, thanks, Rachel. Uh, we have time for some questions. I see a few have started to come in. Um, please uh, submit additional questions. Uh, Robert Nakuda uh, says, when do you anticipate the full Sky Survey uh, data products, uh, that is the catalog to be released? Um, look, our our intention would be to release it as soon as as soon as we um, as soon as we believe it, basically. Um, yeah. So so um, I would say probably about eighteen months. Um, there are 
I mean, it, it, it's forced us to think very hard about an issue that has been discussed a little bit today, which is, you know, the mix of galaxy and um, AGN light. Um, and obviously, um, you know, the spatial implications, uh, you know, the, the angular scales on which things are being sampled. And so, so we'll be doing this pretty carefully. Great. Uh, Robert said he meant uh, Seifert's and Neil may have a follow-up, so I'll... Uh... Uh, I just wanted to ask it a, a related question. So SkyMapper clearly you know, has generated, I guess, a lot of data already. Are, are there plans to make these data uh, publicly available to, to, to the world at some point and how, how will that be working? Yes, yeah, yeah. so, so data release one and two are, are already openly available. Um, and data release three, um, so the proprietary is about 18 months. Uh, so 18 months from February of this year. So um, about the middle of next year. And what, what do data releases one and two contain, just briefly? Um, so, so, so they've got, um, well, data release one is, doesn't have a lot in it, um, or at least it's, it's pretty shallow. Data, data release two is a, is a shallow catalog, basically, of the whole sky. Okay. Um, I should say, um, I think you'll find Chris, myself, um, very happy to talk to people about using data earlier than that. Um, you know, I mean, obviously we have some students who are doing things, but other than that, very happy to, you know, get involved and provide access. Great, thanks. Uh, and Matthew Graham points us to Graham et al. 2020 and asks what the temporal baseline is for uh, photometry for the changing the quasars. Um, so, so the one, the, the the ones that we've published um, is does he mean those? Um, so, I mean, they were just the you know whenever the data was taken between Manga and SDSS, and they range from a, my recollection is a bit over two years to about twelve or fourteen years. So that you know they're just two data points. Um, SkyMapper does have um, repeat visits, um, nothing like the cadence. Uh, that uh, we'll see with LSST and some of the other surveys that have been talked about today, but but there is um, there are repeat visits, and Chris has a student who's having a look at that stuff at the moment. Um, so there is the potential for SkyMapper to continue uh, repeat visits over the next few years um, if we can keep funding it. Great. Uh, okay, so the couple of side conversations going on here. So Ilsan Yoon asked how we should differentiate a change in look AGNs from the AGN variation, which covers a much broader range of uh, classes. And that was what Matthew had uh, said, re referred to Graham 2020 on, but um, do you have anything to follow up there? Um, <laughs> uh, look, the, the definition I've been using is a change of, of AGN type, um, not just a change of, um, uh, you know, emission line um, or, or continuum um, flux, emission line flux or continuum flux. Um, but I think this, this, you know, clearly exactly how you define this um, and relating that back to the physical model um, is, is, is important. And, you know, obviously both are happening. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, and Matthew just followed up to ask uh, what, what time scale you were referring to in terms of less than 0.1 magnitude variation. Um, uh, so, so we we had to, we, we went to you know re, I mean um, Jack uh, the student who's been doing this combed all the databases so this is a SAS and um, uh, you know uh, um, everything else um, and. So the, the 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 small changes in photometry were over um, a decade or more. Um, now the um, there's not a very good match up between when the spectra were taken and when there was photometry. Uh, we just had to take what was publicly available. Um, so 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 those limits are not absolutely watertight, but there was, there was no evidence of the, 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 the sort of G-band variations that other people have seen. Okay. 
All right. Um, thanks, Rachel. Um, and I want to thank uh, the speakers uh, both this afternoon and this morning for the uh, two sessions. Uh, and just remind everybody that we will be starting again in the morning with the fifth session. Uh, Wei Zhang Yu is going to talk about uh, higher order uh, karma modeling of, of AGN variability. Uh, Yue Shen is going to talk about AGN uh, broad line reverberation mapping. Uh, and uh, Andrew Robinson is going to talk about AGN uh, dust reverberation mapping. Uh, Neil, any other announcements that you want to give? Uh, I guess I would just ask uh, the speakers, particularly ones who have good ideas about metrics, to email me their, their metrics by, by 6 p.m. today. And I, if, they, if they were in the, the slides, I would ask that you just cut and paste them out of your slides into a standard text file. That would be helpful because I'm trying to collate a lot of stuff.